in honor. Don Giuseppe Berardelli, 72 years old, a priest from Bergamo, Italy. When suffering from the coronavirus, he gave his ventilator to a young patient. And then he died. That is honor, Mr. President. Bravery, generosity, kindness, selflessness, and I ask you to consider the vast contrast with you. Enough said? Well, maybe not. And that was from early on. Uh, this is Margaret Mead and the question. I, relect, I recollect this because I believe writing makes a difference and hope others will appreciate this story. I've heard it several times, although I've not verified it. However, I do not think that's necessary as the point made is both timely and eternal. Years ago, anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student, and I guess everyone else in the class, expected Mead to talk about fish hooks, clay pots, grinding stones, or the flaking of obsidian. Mead said the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was, for her, a femur, a thigh bone that had been broken and healed. The ensuing, ensuing silence had her explain. She said, in the animal kingdom, such an injury is fatal. One cannot run from danger, get to the river for a drink, or go in search of food. You are meat for any of the prowling predators. Thus, no animal survives such an incapacitating injury long enough for the bone to heal. So, she went on, the femur, which had healed, was, for Margaret, evidence that someone had stayed on with the injured party, perhaps bound up the wound carried the person to safety and tended to them through their recovery. Who knows? She concluded by talking about how helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. She paused before adding, we are at our best when we serve others. Okay. I like that one just because I quote Margaret Mead in other areas. Now this one, um, is, <laughs> let me get it here, eat the D. Now this one is uh, from a prompt and it's the prompt was destructive forces. And I decided to make a top 10 list like they do sometimes. Uh, destructive forces, the top 10 list, number one. Now, this could be a fun prompt. You know me, always up for some writing. So here is the top 10 most destructive horses. So let's begin with number 10, time. Time will tell, as they say, and it always does, no matter what one prefers, wants, or wishes. It will always out you, eventually, no matter that it proves to be an illusion, which, if true, means everything else is. Which, while it may not be, which while it may not be painful, is certainly destructive to the ego, if nothing else, which means everything. And then for number nine, how about ego? Now that little motherfucker sure knows how to make a mess of things. Has throughout history made a cess mess out of every relationship, and no matter how costly the mistake, it will repeat them, and not because it likes reruns but is, for a plethora of reasons, determined to keep banging its head against the wall, any wall, until the world gets it right. It's might makes right, you know, which is to say, all holy hell, so long as the world is, well, unimpressed with the effort. And I'll offer for numbers eight and seven, truth and lies. The world is full of stories where, when the truth wills out, wars start or end, nations and empires fall, leaders die or get recycled, peoples gain or peoples gain or lose whatever is precious to them. But perhaps what's most amazing to me is that truth, truth is on the list. So I nominate, go on to numbers six and five. I nominate science and its opposite ignorance. 
While I don't know which of them takes precedence, and I suppose it doesn't matter, for the former, I have to say that science is ever making something as profound as knowledge new. This ever-changing perception of reality as a consequence has old things vanish, thus it destroys whatever was before. Now, as for ignorance, well, I don't know if the dire cost of that particular foible can ever be calculated, but it must surely be immense. Think of all the public or personal pain and suffering, but it can also be horrific in nature and grandiose in scale. Wars come to mind, for example, as one of the more obvious consequences of ignorance. Now, as to four, hmm, I would guess nature itself. After all, life is ever evolving, supplanting old with new. Think evolution and or erosion. The nature of nature is all about change. This very destructive, although not in the way science is perhaps, nor ignorance for that matter. For three, I'll go with entropy, the measure of the disorder existent within a system, analogous to the random errors, noise, if you will, in the transmission of signals, error creep, genetic mutations, for example, which is part of what drives evolution, and so extinctions happen. But entropy also covers more, the creation of the elements, the process in which the lightest hydrogen somehow produces all the rest, all the elements therefore destroy all that hydrogen in order to eventually make everything we know, everything we are, in a material sense, which some say is the real sense. Pretty big order for number three. Well, there we are at number two, and for this I suggest God or the universe. I mean to say, didn't its creation utterly destroy beyond anyone's ability to reconstruct, theorize, or find any evidence of whatever it was before? Don't all those rationalist types, scientists themselves say, well, first there was nothing, and then boom, there was something, by which they meant everything, of course. But to be logically accurate, it would be much better to say, at first there was something about which we knew nothing, or know nothing, have no evidence of, and cannot know, and then poof, everything we know came out of that, whatever it was, and everything that it was was completely overwritten. Very tall order. Irrationalists are more straightforward. They say, and then there was light. So maybe light, God, the universe, or the self-consistent instability, entropy, or whatever was before, that unknown something else that became all that is, and consequently all that will be. Hmm. So, I bet you're wondering what could possibly be number one. Good question. Well, here it is. Life itself. Now, hear me out. Isn't it ever and only evolving? Which means it replaces or displaces, consumes, destroys, whatever forms it takes in a continual no-holds-barred, endless melee, a cosmic free-for-all? That is my candidate for number one. All the others being included in it if logic be true to its ultimate purpose, or so I argue. So the 10 best destructive forces known. Um, let's see here. These are all, these are all pretty well new. And this one, um, this one is for people who believe what others say of them, especially if what others say of them is insulting, demeaning, depreciative, ignorant. Here you go. Uh, kind of self-defense. You are not broken. How could that be? How? The soul Limitless, knows no bounds, cannot be harmed in any manner, taken from you, or a victim of shame. It is forever yours, never apart from you, always perfect and always safe, no matter what. You are not broken. You are whole, wonderful, unique, a gift to life, and life's gift to eternity and back again. As such, you are never separated from the great happiness that is sorrowless, sorrowless, sorrowless. You 
a light in this world, inextinguishable, have always been, is, and ever will be. You are not broken. How could that be? Not broken by their words, not broken by their faces, their claims, their ignorance, their dissonance, their shaming, uncaring cruelty. You are not broken. You are well, a wellspring. You are a voice, a song of the soul. You shine, you go, and you are not broken. You know, <laughs> I tell you, uh, it's exactly that. We are, have been, will be. Um, now, this one here uh, happens to be a true story, no matter how strange it seems. I call it musical mystery. Uh, you recollect, recollect the Twilight Zone? How about One Step Beyond? The television shows whose stock and trade was mystery. Well, I have one, and it is a puzzler. And about 25 years ago, I bought a full set of chromatic harmonicas. These are very expensive, actually, back then, even now. Then, quite recently few weeks back, months, I was reorganizing my gig bag, so-called, and one of them was missing, the one in the key of B. I looked and looked, but it was gone. So I went online and found another, a Honer Chromatica 48 key of B. It looked exactly like the other ones I had. This time around, it was $256 with change. I was happy to see it arrive and whipped it out to warm it up almost immediately. I could not help but notice one set of its reeds sounded bad, very bad. All the others were fine. So I looked the thing over and soon saw that its wooden body was cracked. What's more, upon investigation, I found the crack ran the whole comb through so that the associated set of channels couldn't direct the airflow under their individual reeds. Rather, anytime you tried to play one, they would play their associated sharp or flat, which was bad. Then came the consequences, of course, figuring out who to contact and how, plodding along the circuitous routes of websites, noting names, checking boxes, emails, scribbling reference numbers. And then there was the waiting calling, being put on hold, though I have to say everybody was friendly and all the while I would just say, I want the harmonica I paid for. I just want to replace my harmonica. About two weeks, I was given a full credit refund because I could not return it because harmonicas are a non-returnable item. Go figure. I hadn't thought of that. Then a couple of days after that was all done, I thought, you know, well, it's only broken. What if I could repair the comb? Thus, obtain what I wanted, a fully functional chromatic harmonic in the key of B. It would be a silly Saturday project worthy of the name. So, on a friendly kind of Saturday, I had my small desk tools out, magnifying glass, glue, several kinds of tape, sandpaper, some plastic strips, all sorts of odds and ends spread out on a white cloth. I took the harmonica out of its case and was about to begin its disassembly when I thought, play it one more time. Well, imagine my face when it played perfectly, absolutely perfectly. There was a WTF moment, of course, then profound confusion when I saw the crack was no longer there. Then I checked to see if it was the B harmonica, harmonica after all, and it was. So then I checked my set, and they were all just as they had been before. The B is, was still missing, again, nowhere to be found. So I played it this time one note at a time. Everything was fine. So WTF with this. Wendy was puzzled too. We deemed it a mystery. How is it I bought a broken instrument, which then without explanation became fully functional. And the topper, the topper was that the logo was now on the harmonica where it hadn't been 
before. Ah, so cut, fade to black, cue the music, WTF. <laughs> you know, it's, I had to write the poem. I had to write that poem. You, you have four minutes, Dan. Thank you, dear. I was just noticing that. I looked. Um, this is just for humor's sake. I'm not going to do the whole thing, just part of it. Super callous, fragile, racist, sexist, Nazi potus. Yes, it's ugly in appearance and something quite atrocious. When it speaks, it often shrieks with prejudice ferocious. Our super callous, fragile, racist, sexist, Nazi potus. Because he was raised as a jerk, he was always sad. He never, ever had to work and so became a wastrel cad. Grabbing pussy, he was the joke since he was just a lad. As was anyone he got to poke, which was both huge and sad. But then he rose to fame one day and taking all the polls, he became our Cheeto Prez, which sucks even as it blows. <laughs> I'm not going to finish that, but you know, you get the point. Um, good. And I'm going to finish with this one. It's called Light, Light, Light. From the start of this universe until now, there has always been the light. Clearly, it is an essential factor for what else do we all come to eventually and are right, but the light, light, light. No thing overshadows this. It's what moves this poor body, causes my fingers to trace such moments as this, counsels the passion coursing my heart well, and what so enlivens my giddy soul tonight, but the light, light, light. Terms cannot describe or contain this. Actions provide mere indications. Lyrics might bear it so long as the breath bears them. Nothing temporal can be seen without it, and all things eternal are made up only of it. What else moves us within so as to create without passing for inspiration sight of the light, light, light? And so in the deep cold world of winter, when sullen, lifeless, and leaden heavens occlude the hope of celestial bodies, when the landscape beneath is set in a monochromatic display, yes, fish may still seize the day beneath their ice, yes, furtive, furtive burrowing survivors do abide and the heart of an owl harbors its heated blood as it wings down silently after sighting its prey dark talons clutch the unwary or luckless where blood spatters on moonlit white what else rules there but the light 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 what muffles the tolling bell better than distance and time? What rings it ever clearer to echo in the mind? What is the message it means to send all these years later? What do I do by telling you this? Why do such words make their way here? What causes my spirit to soar, my heart and mind to quicken? What makes a difference, no matter how seemingly slight, but the light, light, light? When death is no longer distant, a dismissed threat, but present, promise, and immediately certain, your intimate companion, if you will, waiting on you, so to speak, hand and foot, what will move still until that very last? What makes its essential difference felt? What is there to keep in sight? But the light, light, light. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I, thank you, Mitch, for having me. And yeah. uh, I'm going to see what happens when I tell it to stop recording now. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs>